Obama, which is out right now. Joining us now is Richard Fowler, political commentator, host of the online news program, The Richard Fowler Show. Richard, you've heard what Ben has had to say on the, on the legal questions here, your response to his critique of the whole Obama administration. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Larry, and I appreciate being here. Uh, and Ben, good to see you. Yeah, you, uh, you know, Larry, I got to tell you, I, I think this uh, this criticism of the president is a little far-reaching for me because I think if you're going to criticize President Obama, the question I have is where were they when George W. Bush was having ridiculous government overreach? And that's fair. I, I think that's totally fair. I think that, but now's the time when, why don't we all get together and figure out, okay, how do we prevent this in the future? Because we can all do this routine. You know, why, why are people who, who didn't back George W. Bush back then when President Bush was going into Afghanistan, backing President Obama's plans for a troop surge in Afghanistan now. Turns out there's two sides to the political debate. I'm, what I'm calling for at this point, whether we were wrong then or wrong now, let, let's get together and figure out exactly how we fix the problem of executive overreach. Yeah, if Bush you, was overreaching, so is Obama, you right? you say that in the book? Yeah, cool. I absolutely do. Well, I mean, listen, I hear that if we're going to come together, I think that what needs to happen is that folks on the right that, you know, run, who are part of the city and run half the United States Congress should be willing to come together to deal with um, government overreach. And we haven't seen that yet. Republicans have sat on their hands on most issues. Besides having multiple and multiple witch trial hearings, or kabuki theater, like I like to call it, you know, I'd rather see them say, let's find a way to solve immigration so the president doesn't have to act, or let's find a way to reform our tax code so the president doesn't have to act, or let's find a way to fix to give more money funding to our embassy so the president doesn't have to act. All, all, what seems to be happening here, Mayor o Larry, is a dereliction of duty when it comes to the right. Um, and so now they're playing the blame game when they really haven't put forward any solutions. Well, Richard, when it comes to the solutions, I think the bigger problem here is not the question of particular issues, honestly. I think the question is the one that you've stated, which is you're, you're using the president's action as a threat. Why, don't, why doesn't Congress do X so the president doesn't have to do it? Why doesn't Congress do Y so the president doesn't have to do it? The problem is the president is not given the power to do these things. When the president goes ahead well, and think, does well, it— Well, wait a minute now. Go ahead. I think the president does have the power to stop deportations. And I think like what we saw just a couple of days That's ago, right, the president of law, also has the power to— the president also has the power to make sure that federal contractors don't fire LGBTQ folks. These are all parts of the president's executive power, being that he's the administer of the executive branch. I'm not sure what, it, what, it, what is administrative about ignoring basic facts of American law, such as that it is a crime to cross the border illegally. And believe me, I'm somebody who actually is for immigration reform. But this is not a question of whether immigration reform is a good idea or a bad one. It's do you really want to give the president this, this ability? Because, That's Richard, if you really want to give the president this much power, then you can't be surprised if the president turns around, he'll we like somebody on the other side. He turns around and says, okay, let's deport everyone. Uh, you want to give him this much discretion? Well, I don't. Wait, 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 no, wait a second. L let's be very clear, because I think you're mixing apples and oranges here. Uh, and let's be very clear about the pre This president has deported any uh, more individuals than any other president That's in recent true. history. That's not true. But what, that, that is true. That is not he's true. He's changed, the, deportations. he's changed the statistics. The statistics used to be measured that if you came to the border and you were rejected, that did not count as a deportation. He's, he's now been changed that, if, that, and that those it's a lie. It's not true. It's and, not true. And what he, what he has done now, the folks who aren't being deported are those individuals who came to this country at no fault of their own, who pledge allegiance to our flag, they go to our schools, and they want to pursue the American dream. Some of these individuals serve in our military. And the president has the power to instruct his secretaries to do whatever he chooses to see fit for them to do. And there we and go. That is That's not a violation and that, of federal uh, law. The, he, can, he can instruct his secretaries to do whatever he see, sees fit to do. And this is the problem on yeah. every issue but of but American law. But that is not a violation me, of federal law. Uh, let me interrupt, guys, because I'm not a lawyer, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there is a very pressing issue going on now in Iraq. What are your thoughts on it, Richard? Well, listen, I think this is—the president loses any on any situation here, and I think people like uh, our friend there from Breitbart will attack this president no matter what he does. The truth of the matter is, is this. We shouldn't have gotten the war in Iraq to begin with, and now it is time for the people of Iraq and the government of Iraq to finally stand up and deal with their own mess. And I think if we're going to provide support as a country, that support can only come after Iraq figures out exactly what it's going to do. Ben? Well, okay, here, there are really three separate questions when it comes to Iraq. Should we have gotten in? Should we have gotten out? And what do we do now? Right, and, and the first two questions are actually sort of irrelevant to the third. Meaning, I can actually, I can, I, I hear the argument we shouldn't have gotten in in the first place. Certainly, getting out looks like a mistake now that there's a massive chaotic situation over there. In terms of the third solution, doing nothing and saying that, oh well, throwing up our hands, well, I guess what happens there happens there. That's a pre-9/11 mentality that suggests that whatever happens there is a regional problem and we'll never have any blowback. What here. should you do? What we should do is we should put military advisors on the ground, particularly in Kurdistan, where we help out some of the folks who actually want to defend the country. And look, if if we actually 
care about the status of the country. The last thing we should be doing is helping the Iranians invade the southern half of the country and then helping the Sunnis invade the northern half of the country. This is exactly what the left wanted with regard to Iraq way back in the middle of the last decade. They wanted this to turn into Vietnam. Vietnam was a war that was won until we cut funding and pulled out. And this was also a war that was won until we cut funding and pulled out. Go ahead, uh, uh, Richard. Larry, that's utterly, 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 completely not true. Right? And if you listen to folks like John McCain, who always believes we should arm the rebels, which is his solution to everything, and putting our men and women in harm's way once again to solve a quagmire of a situation that we've created. Let's be very clear about this. It was created under George W. Bush. This president has brought our, <laughs> our men and women back home in the safety of America. And now we've got to figure out a solution. And to be honest with you, this government, the Iraqi government, has got to stand up. This cannot always be America's nightmare. The Iraqi government has to stand up and say, we're going to take control. What this president, what the president of Iraq to do is reach out to the Sunnis, reach out to the Shias, make concessions, and find a way to run his government. We do it here in America. They do it in India. They do it in Pakistan. They do it all across the world. People come together. Different factions come together and rule a country equally. And this president, the president of Iraq, hasn't been able to do that. And we have to be held accountable for his actions before we put our men and women back in harm's way. Why is it our problem? It, it was, it's our problem because, to a certain extent— Because ex we invaded them. Well, <laughs> yeah, yes, because we invaded them. But also beyond that, because once we're there and you make promises to people who are now being mowed down in the street, by the way, if you feel no moral obligation about that, but you feel a moral obligation about 270 girls who get kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria, then I question where exactly your moral feelings lie. Because the fact is, tens of thousands of people are going to get killed there. Possibly, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands have already been moved into exile, essentially. Right. You and want to send advisors. I, I certainly want to send advisors. What else advisors. do you want to send advisors? Uh, airstrikes on, on ISIS. Airstrikes. We can, we can airstrike Gaddafi's forces in Libya, in a country we have nothing to do with, but we won't airstrike ISIS. Don't go away. The debate continues with Ben and Richard right after this. What's wrong with that, Richard? Why not airstrike? Well, well, listen, I think... I would like for him to define what military advisors mean, one, because we've already trained the Iraqi military, and it's not our fault the Iraqi military is surrendering as fast as possible, right? That's not our issue. That's not our problem. Now, where I do agree with him is I think that's, I don't, I have no problem, I think this president has no problem with some sort of drone warfare, sending some drones over there to strike ISIS. But with that being said, we need a, a, a solution where all the parties are at the table. And unfortunately, that can only happen when the Iraqi government stands up here. Well, that, that also happens, actually, and was happening when the American military was there. I mean, if you read the pieces in The New Yorker by a great reporter who's, who's actually on the left, he was talking in, in specific detail about the fact that when the U.S. military was there, they were speaking every day, every day, with, the, with, with Maliki. So and they were telling him. How long do you want the U.S. military to be there, is the question. If the U.S. military there is, for, is there for decades, we can how, live. How long, do you want our men's and, how long do you want our men and women to be put in harm's way? Let me ask you this. How many American men and women were you willing to let die for no reason now? Because now the, now the country is gone, right? So you got 4,500 American men and women who died there, and their blood is worth nothing. Because because the country is gone. And veterans are saying this. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Well, first of all, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. And I Well, you, you can not, argue that, but the bottom line is, on once the war was point. won, why but give it rate, back? How, mu how much more American blood do you want to shed for a, a, co for a conflict that is not, not our conflict and a government that is literally irresponsible? You, uh, don't you think uh, the American public will not support troops on the ground? You know I, that. I, I, think, I think at this point you're probably right. The American public will not By support troops margin. on the ground. By a wide margin, because this, is a, this has become a country that has now slipped into a pre-9-11 mentality, which is why we are now going to surrender Afghanistan back to the Taliban and Iraq to a combined force of al-Qaeda slash ISIS in the north and Iran in the, in the south. All right, some other political things. Your reaction to the, to the defeat of, uh, of Mr. Cantor? Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think that it has a couple of ramifications. It, it once again shows kind of the, the difference between the establishment Republican Party and the grassroots. That election really had nothing to do with the Tea Party. The Tea Party didn't spend any money in it, and the Tea Party really didn't do much in that race. That was much more about Cantor not being in his district a lot and being a little bit out of touch. As far as the immigration issue, I think it's a great thing for Democrats, because now you're going to see President Obama do what he's wanted to do all along. He's going to claim he has no partners on the Republican side of the aisle on immigration reform, and then he's going to move toward executive action. He's going to threaten the American people if they don't elect Democrats who are allies of so his before the, November, he's going he's to amnesty 11 million That defeat will help Democrats. Absolutely, it'll help Democrats. What do you think, Richard? 
Well, I didn't know immigration reform was a threat, but hey, uh, who's, a, who, who's asking the questions here? But, but Larry, listen, I think where I, where I do agree is I think the reason why Eric Cantor lost his race is because, once again, we all know the, the, the truth of the line that all politics are local. Uh, and Eric Cantor just didn't play the local ground game. This guy, he, he outspent this guy on ads and other stuff, but when it came to talking to people of his district, he just didn't get it done. Now, but what I think this does say for the broader Republican Party um, on immigration and, and on other issues, on raising the minimum wage, is that what you're going to find is a more divided government in Washington. If Eric Cantor, who is as conservative as conservative can be, who, who sort of tipped his foot into water on immigration reform, can lose his seat, then all Republicans are going to feel as though they're vulnerable. They're going to go all the way to the right, and we're going to have a dysfunctional government because Republicans refuse to come to the table and work with this president. Why can't we have immigration reform? I mean, the reason we George can't. Bush led the parade. I mean, listen, I'd be fine with immigration reform. I think most Americans actually agree on immigration reform on this basic, immigrants. on this ba exactly on this basic count, right? You can't have this uh, at a very basic level. You can't have a welfare state with open borders, right? Because people come across the border and take advantage of the welfare state. So what you have to do first is you have to secure the border, and then you figure out what to do with the people here, whether that means pathway to citizenship or whether that means just legal residency. And I think that pretty much everybody agrees on that. The problem is that the president has been so lax on border security that people don't trust his enforcement of border security. So this has been the well, sticking point. Well, well. Wait a second here. Now, first, I don't think that border security and a pathway to citizenship are mutually exclusive. Those two things can happen simultaneously at the same time, Why? and that is the compromise. That is, that is the place of compromise Why for Democrats and Republican, Larry. They can happen at the same time. We can build a fence. We can build a wall. We can build electric fence if that's what they want. But at the same time, we need to provide a pathway to citizenship for those 11 millions that are in the shadows. The Republican Party's problem is, is they cannot get a pathway through citizenship out of the United States House of Representatives, whether they like it or not, whether we beat up the border or not, whether we put not uh, Marine, Marine Team 6 on the border, they would still not be able to pass a pathway to citizenship. That's simply not true. If you secured the border, people that would pass true. a pathway Look to citizenship. Count the votes. I promise you, I know the Republican Party pretty well. And, and if, you, if you were to secure the border, then you would be able to pass a pathway to citizenship. You would. It's, well, it, why it, can't those happen? Why, why are those two things mutually exclusive? Why are they connected? Because if we're dealing with immigration, we're dealing with immigration as a total issue. They're not separate issues. The, of course they're separate issues, because the fact is that if no, you do not—, not. Okay, it's fine. all about you're maintaining right. what, our border and having immigration control. So, 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 so you're right. Let's assume you're right. And, and we'll, completely, we'll completely connect them, okay? But the way we'll connect them is we won't, we won't have any border security. Amnesty for everybody. Is there a problem or no? That's not what, but see, but, but this is this is this is where we, this is exactly where they go to, Larry. Every time we have this, this is where we say, go to. Why don't we you explain why forever. they have to be and connected? That is not. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. That is not what's in the Senate bill. In the Senate bill, which is the Democratic solution, which has been endorsed by the president and all the Democrats in the United States Senate, that bill strengthens our border. It increases border security, and at the same time, provides a very, very, very long pathway to citizenship that takes almost ten years. It is completely and totally bipartisan. Yet still, Republicans in the House won't even bring the bill to the floor for a vote. Richard, that I just tells have one you question. right there, Larry, that they don't agree with the pathway to citizenship. Why, why, why can't they vote? Honestly, I have one question in all of this. Seriously, just one question. Why not just secure the border and then put a pathway to citizenship why in? Why can't those happen at the same time? Why don't you answer my question instead of asking me back why? I, I just explained to you why they can't. Here's why they can't happen at the same time. As you yeah. secure the border, the border remains somewhat open. People cross the border because they feel that if they get in before the deadline, if they get in before the border is secure, then they are somehow included have in the pathway the to citizenship. Bill? Of course I've read the bill. And not only have I read the bill, well, the I've been watching what's happening the, on the border with tens of thousands of children the crossing the, the border in anticipation of amnesty. Wait, wait, because we have no, what do you think is happening? there's no law right now. But in oh, the that's Senate no bill, law right we now. talk Got about it. we talk about You're right. There's no law against qualifies. crossing the border illegally. We in the Senate bill we talk about who qualifies for a pathway to citizenship, and those deadlines do not do not apply to those individuals across the border. And how tomorrow, are you going to magically determine that, Richard? Today. Do they have a magical like? It's do they in have the a bill? Right, they have a, read the bill. I've read the bill, Richard. Can you explain to me well, when you, you haven't read it correctly? When, when you determine when you determine who has crossed the border when, I was unaware that everybody who crosses the border has a no, barcode saying when they. Came across. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the bill and have you both back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thanks, yeah, Richard. Thanks, Richard. I look forward to having you both back soon. Ben's book, The People versus Barack Obama, the criminal case against the Obama administration, is available now. And you can catch Richard Fowler at FowlerShow.com. For my. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks to Antifa and the supposed anti-fascist brigade for exposing what the radical left truly is. All of America is watching because you guys are so stupid. As far as the idea that, you know, I'm a white supremacist in service to Trump Pence, a couple problems there. One, as far as the service to Trump Pence, um, again, I didn't vote for Trump or Hillary. I didn't vote for either of them, actually. So this idea that I am somehow a servant of Trump is absurd and requires you to be functionally illiterate. As far as the idea I'm a white supremacist, you see the thing on the top of my head, right? This funny hat. It's called a yarmulke. Hey, white supremacists aren't that fond of it, which is why I was, according to the Anti-Defamation League, the number one recipient of white supremacist anti-Semitism on the internet among journalists in 2016. But no, I'm a white supremacist now. Because this is the way the left works, right? If you don't agree with them, everyone's a white supremacist. You're a Nazi, Nazis should be punched, and therefore it's totally fine to stand outside and try to shut down events if you can get away with it. The reason that I am here is because fascism does not own this university. Because there are students who do want to hear differing views, who don't want to be told that they can only hear one view, who don't believe that the First Amendment should die under the jackboots and Birkenstocks of a bunch of anarchist communist pieces of garbage.